My name is Ira Padnos. Uh, I'm from the Ponderosa Stomp Foundation. I'm going to be moderating. Unfortunately, New Orleans time, most people, when you tell them more, at eight, 9 o'clock, they seem to think in, in nighttime. So part of our panel is on its way. Please excuse it. Um, but we're, you know, this is, it's priceless that we get this opportunity to have these gentlemen join us. On my far right, we have Mr. Harold Batiste. For those of you that don't know this gentleman's accomplishments, Mr. Batiste started off as a jazz musician. He uh, went out to uh, L.A. and was playing gigs with Ornette Coleman. He then hooked up with uh, Keen Records and produced Sam Cooke's You Send Me. From there, he was signed by Art Roop to be the New Orleans and our and our man came back to New Orleans, supervised countless sessions, including uh, Art Neville's Chiduki Do, among others. He then was noticing that the uh, musicians, many of the session musicians, weren't reaping the benefits or financial gains of their work and started All for One or AFO, which was the first black musician to own label probably in the country. Unfortunately, despite their attempts to, uh, in their business model, it seems that they uh, were undone by their distributor, Juggy Murray. He then uh, went back to uh, AFO, was working for S S Sam Cooke, doing stuff for SAR Records, did a lot of session work, did stuff with Phil Spector, helped mastermind the, early, the Dr. John's Grigory record, among others, spent many years in L.A., and then moved back to New Orleans to spearhead the University of New Orleans Jazz Studies program. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Hal Batiste. Next to him, we have Mr. Wardell Kazair, uh, nicknamed the Creole Beethoven by Alan Toussaint. Wardell started his uh, first arrangements that came to note were on Dave Bartholomew's New Orleans House Party album. He also had worked some with uh, Bernadine Washington on imperial, the, the apparel sides. He then worked with practically everybody in New Orleans through the years doing arrangements, and many of his uh, better-known hits for, that you will be familiar with is... Uh, the Dixie Cups, Ico, Ico, and Chapel of Love, done for Redbird Records. He also had Barefooting for no, by Robert Parker for Nola. Another great song was Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye, Danny White, recorded for Frisco Records. In addition to that, there's the great work he did with the legendary session in, in, uh, at Malco Studios with uh, Gene Knight and King Floyd producing Groove Me and Mr. Big Stuff. He later worked with Paul Simon, Aaron Neville, and countless others. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wardell Kazair. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to start and grounding this, since this is kind of a recorded, uh, your, your, your specialty is recorded music, I thought we'd start out by talking about what your first experiences, uh, both of you, was when you first encountered Cosmo Matassa Studio in New Orleans. What was it like for, when your very first time walking in there? Oh, wow. When was the first time I went in Cosmo? God, oh man, that was a long <laughs> time ago. Uh, no, it wasn't Joe Jones. Let me see. I did the first thing I did. The first big hit that I got was a song called "You Talk Too Much." Y'all might not be old enough to even remember that. <laughs> oh yes, y'all. Well, y'all older than me then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that was in that was in Joe you know, he, he, he had a studio above uh, what all south all south uh, on Barone Street. And we did a session, you know, that, that you talk too much up there. But I'm trying to remember when the first time I went to the Cosmos to, uh, you know, Marvel was with the American Jazz Quintet, because that's when we, we did our first jazz record there, back in, what, it was 1961 or something like that. But uh, Cosmo was always a sort of a hero of mine. Two, guy, two guys were my, my childhood heroes, was Cosmo Motassa and Dave Bartholomew. You ever heard of Dave, Dave Bartholomew? Y'all know, know Dave Bartholomew. And, and, and it was funny, the reason, the reason why I idolized those two guys, because I noticed they didn't smoke. <laughs> Neither one of them smoked. And I was real odd in those days to see somebody that didn't smoke. Because, <laughs> I mean, anyway, but that's, that's when I first... 
So, Ardell, you pretty much, I believe that your first session, one of your first sessions was doing the New Orleans house party record with Dave Bartholomew and working with his Dave Bartholomew's great band. What was that like? Very nice. When, uh, first of all, when I met Kaz, uh, he's a very nice man and very calm. You know, I remember doing a session with uh, Barefooting with him. And uh, we were rehearsing, getting the tune ready, boom, 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 boom. We finally came to uh, what I really liked. And so we rehearsed it for the last time. So we did it, and, man, it had a groove on that unreasonable groove. And I told Carl, play back. He said, play what back? <laughs> he said, you didn't tell me you were recording. I said, <laughs> and I tell you what, it took me at least another half an hour to get that Sam feeling to uh, to a barefooting. But that was one of the first encounters I met him. Of course, we did the session with uh, with uh, with Dave uh, uh, House Party, and that was a, oh man, they had some great musicians on that. Uh, I remember that. I remember. I did another uh, big band thing with uh, uh, Professor Long here. And I tell you what, it was another studio, not the main one that he had before. And if you ever seen a pack of sardines, <laughs> you should have been in that rehearsal, I mean, in that recording session. I think the only thing that was lacking was the, uh, uh, was the olive oil in the can. <laughs> it was that tight. But uh, we did it, man, and I, re I remember that it had so many... Different thing. The drummer was a uh, uh, Smokey Johnson. He pounded the drum so hard that he had uh, he had blood coming from his thumb to the forefinger in between that that section there. And he had to tape his his uh, his finger. He was hitting the heart, uh, the uh, the drum so hard. I was wondering why he must have some kind of two. He must have some tough bull skin on those on those drums because he really pounded hard on that. Uh, the singer. Uh, we had to tie Professor Lawn had um, uh, his uh, his legs to the arm, to the uh, to the uh, uh, leg of the of the piano because when piano when he sings he keeps the tempo with his uh, with his uh, leg you know and uh, really he don't need a drummer but <laughs> <laughs> but he did have one that day and that was Smokey Johnson and we had to tie his back I mean his arm to his back. Because he was playing this thing, dilly -ding -dilly -ding -ding -ding, with the left hand only, so we had to tie his right hand to the uh, uh, to his back. And uh, he, because you see, at that time, the only thing I was noted for when I came up was, you know, I, I really, man, I, I, I wasn't no pioneer or anything like that. I just followed the trend of what was going on, but in, into a larger expect, you know, like the use of the horns, horns in sessions and all of that. That time. Before my time, like in Harold's time, you know, it was before my time. Uh, <coughs> uh, <laughs> and when I mean bad, I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about uh, yeah, yeah, recording, you know, recording yeah. time. So uh, I know you're older than me, but I mean, I won't say it to the public, though. <coughs> this is not the public. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, his name made me lose my throat, Harold. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, at the session, I had my brother that played. Uh, what he did, he he got some broomsticks and some Coca-Cola uh, uh, tops, and he cleared all of the cork out of the top and, and mailed everything to to the broomstick and made it sound like a uh, a big uh, tambourine or something like that, you know. So that was on the session. We had good good hard players. The thing, like I said, we was in the we was in a small studio, so uh, but it really worked out good. It was nice working with the guys. But that was one of my first things with Dave and, and uh, the thing with uh, Professor Longhead. And I think I graduated to uh, to some of the other stuff with the Dixie Cups. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Harold, can you talk a little bit about one of the early, uh, with the first session you did with All for One on uh, one of the early one, your first hit making but, session with Prince Lala and. Uh, Barbara George. Okay, I can talk about that. But at first, first I'd like to see. I don't know who these people are. I don't know who I'm talking to. You know, they know who we are, but we don't know nothing about them. These are these these are scholars, Harold, from oh, the American scholars, American side, and recording people. <laughs> <laughs> and and they, they're all uh, they're they're here for the American Society of Recorded Recording 
American. So you don't know either. <laughs> no, I know who they are. I'm sorry, but they got—I forgot the things. But they're here. They're here to learn about you, and, and they're interested. Uh, in, okay. Yeah. All right. But yeah, I was really amazed to come down here and see you know all of you people here. And this is a hard morning. I already know that. I told him anyway that I had to do. Uh, at, I had to get up at five o'clock this morning and do a television show at, that was at five fifteen. And, and and it was and then this this cat come to, to get me talking about to do uh, another panel, which I thought was at night. I thought it was nine o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are again. Now, what you say you want me to talk about? Can you talk a little bit about your first your your uh, the Barbara George and uh, Prince oh that uh, yeah that well see that was the first thing that you know after I. I decided to try to start a record label. And really, uh, it's more important to me why we started that label, uh, because I, I noticed that this was a city that was producing a lot of music. And I, of course, I came up in a black community. It was still segregated then. And I know that most of the stuff that I was familiar with were, were things coming out of the black community. And I noticed that there was no uh, there was no return in the black community economically because no there was no black record companies they were all owned by white people, and so it was almost accepted that cats like you know, Eddie Bo and Thomas Shelvin and all those cats like that were running there to do their records. But and I didn't know then that that was. The independent labels had already started doing that. Is John Brovin here? Yes, he is. He's, He's here. Oh, there he is. There. See, now, see, John Brovin wrote a book called Record Breakers and Record Makers or something like that. If I had had a book like that when I started off, I never would even try to get in the record business. <laughs> No man, boy, man. When I realized how how those uh, all those cats were doing the same thing that was happening here, they had been doing that in all those other little cities. You know where they found out that they had music in the black community. And uh, anyway, that's why AFO was just started like that. It, uh, and it, all for one was an attempt to try to return some of the, the economic value of the kind of music we did back into some of the hands of of people in, in, in our community. But, you know, this, and I hate to say this, y'all, ooh, a lot of white people in here. <laughs> but this is, is, the history of our country has not really changed for our people, not as much. There's a lot of progress that has been made, but there's still a lot of remnants, remnants of slavery. And, and not real slavery, but economic slavery. Uh, you know where the where where the, the all of the money goes one way, and what's left over, and the least of what is left over, stays in the black community, and it causes a lot of other problems that we have now that I really need. It causes a lot of crime, causes a lot. What we call crime, but it's just people trying to survive. With the, oh, don't get me started. Okay, <laughs> what, what you ask me about? <laughs> what you ask me about? Oh, Barbara George. <laughs> <laughs> but but see, uh, uh, Jesse Hill. You ever heard Jesse Hill was a cat had a record called Oopa Would Do. He was signed to uh, Minute Records, was it? Yes, Minute Records. Yeah. But when I started AFO, he wanted to s sign up with AFO, but he couldn't. He was already on the contract. But he 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 was already a big head, big hit, and he had groupies. One of his groupers was Barbara George, you know, and so he brought her to to us. He brought her to us to see if she we we would record her, and um, and accompanying her on guitar to do, so she could audition with a cat named Lawrence Nelson. Uh, uh, and the, Barbara was supposed to do a song called uh, "He Put the Hurt on Me." Uh, but she was having problems with the rhythm, so this boy Lawrence decided to sing it to her to show her how how to get it. But when we heard him singing, he said, "Man, we can record this cat." <laughs> <laughs> so we recorded. We recorded a split session that day. We recorded both 
uh, uh, we, we, we didn't call him Lawrence Nelson, we called him Prince Lala. And, uh, and then we recorded Barbara George, and she had a little song that she had written, a little simple song called, I Know You Don't Love Me No More. And I think what made that hit record was two things. She said, I don't want to be hurted anymore. And that, that word hurt, it just stood out. And then we had a cornet solo on, on the record, that, which was different in those days to have a cornet solo, solo on the record. And that, those were our first two records that we put out, put it out. Uh, and uh, Prince Lala's record was a regional hit. Uh, and Barbara George's went all the way, I think, to number three in the country. Uh, so that launched our record label you know, I mean, it was unheard of for, you know, something like that to happen so, so quickly. And it surprised all of us, too. But it thrilled us. It, when the first day I heard uh, those cat at, at the radio station put our record on the radio, and I realized all the people are hearing that now. Everybody's hearing our record on the radio. It was real. It was a real thrill to hear that. So that's what Barbara George did. And can you tell, talk, discuss a little bit about how the financial gains didn't came back, to, did not come back to you? No, because I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> like I said, John Drum wrote his book too late. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what I was doing, so I didn't understand, you know, how it really worked. Uh, and the the cat who was uh who came down, Juggy Murray. Who, who who actually was looking for a later on man for his record label in New York, Suit Records. I think, yeah, that was it. And uh, he was out in California looking for somebody to come up there and be his A&R, uh, A&R man. He, uh, he ran into a cat I knew out there named Sonny Bono. <laughs> yeah, and Sonny said, well, look, there's a cat in New Orleans. Maybe he would, you know, want to work for y'all and do that. So Juggy Murray called down there and said, tell me what, you know, he wanted somebody to do that. And, but I said, no, man, we just started a little rec- record label down here. We ain't, that was before we put anything out. And he said, you, you signed up with anybody down there? I said, no, no, we ain't so signed up with nothing. He said, well, don't sign with nobody. I'm coming. And he left Los Angeles and came to New Orleans. And none of us knew who he was, but he said he was coming down here, don't sign nothing with nobody, we're going to do this and do that. And we went out to the airport to meet him, but we didn't know who he was, we didn't know whether he was black or white. And he he realized when he saw us out there that we was looking for somebody. And then we found out he was black. And that sort of relieved us, because that, that was our big problem. We said, we, how can we get national distribution for our record? Because there ain't no black distributors, I didn't think. But uh, he had a record label, and we didn't know nothing about, you know, you know, getting another record label to do your stuff. But that's what he brought to us that he had a record label there. But he would just he would take he would sign us up as a something, and he would distribute our record all over the country and distribute on on our label. So we signed up something with him. Just so happy because in in the meantime, was in the meantime uh, there was another black-owned record company in New York. Uh, uh, a guy named uh, the guy. Oh, Bobby Robinson. Bobby Robinson, yeah, Bobby Robinson. Uh, he had he had a little record, and he had got like he had <laughs> he had met a cat that was working for him named Marshall Seahorn. Y'all know Marshall Seahorn? <laughs> Huh? That's what you call him? Oh, oh, oh. My, my partner, Melvin Lancer, who was my partner, called, used to call him Caveman. <laughs> uh, Marshall, so, so Marshall, uh, uh, the, the, no, no, Alan Toussaint, I mean, because I had done a record on this cat before. He, when Alan Toussaint was playing piano for him, his name is Lee Dorsey. He had, uh, and I had done a record on Lee Dorsey called Lolly Moe or something like that. And But uh, Alan Toussaint was supposed to record uh, Lee Dorsey for for Minute Records or somebody. And But uh, Alan, whatever was the complication, Alan, 
Alan couldn't be with us. He, Alan wanted to be with the Air Force, but he couldn't do that either because he was under the contract to men, men it. Uh, so Alan asked me, could I do this session on Lee Dorsey for him? So I got to do that too. And so yeah, yeah, he asked me to do yeah, yeah, and some, whatever else. I had three or four sides to do doing him. So I had to do yeah, yeah. So that that came out, and it came it came out on Bobby Robinson label before we put out Barbara George's record. So his record went up to the charts before uh, I know went up. And the Juggy Murray sort of got I should I started to see pissed off, but I I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Juggy Murray got upset because you know said why y'all didn't give me that <laughs> you know. And I didn't. I, I really didn't. We didn't think in terms of that kind of competition before. I said because we can. We got a lot of people down here. And we we can make records like this for a lot of y'all. We, everybody can get one of these. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's that's what I think upset Juggy Murray uh, and we, with us anyway. You know. And so uh, he got his revenge though very good <laughs> quickly. You know because. You know, he eventually uh, he convinced Barbara. Once once Melvin and I uh, put Barbara on the road, and we took we we started getting him shows and stuff like that. She did the Regal Theater in Chicago, and then she did the uh, Howard, I think it is, in Washington. And next, she was going to do the Apollo at uh, in New York. So it was. Melvin and I said, well, when she gets to New York, Juggy can take over for, you know, because we, we had brought her out on the road, and then we could come back home and let Juggy handle it. Man, this cat got <laughs> Barbara, poor Barbara in New York, bought her a Cadillac and a fur coat. Now, y'all didn't laugh, but that's laughable. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, it really shocked me that he would do something like that. He got that young girl, and she was only 19 years old. And he, she didn't understand it, she, that he was taking her money and giving her a Cadillac made him, made her think she, he was giving her a Cadillac. That's the, who, what, the, who's that guy who did Cadillac, that movie Cadillac Records or something? Y'all don't know who it was? Huh? Yeah. Chet, none of Chet. So I said, that's where that came from, a Cadillac went. So Juggie was in that business. He bought her a Cadillac and bought her a fur coat and uh, told her that she needs to buy her contract from us. And she went for it. And, and, and we didn't know what was going on you know, in New York until her, Barbara's mother called. They were still living in the project line in New Orleans. And her mama called and said, Barbara wants to buy her contract. I said, you got to be got that wrong. I know she don't want to buy a contract for months. But uh, Melvin and I decided, man, we better go up there to New York and find out what's going on. And so we went We went to New York. And, uh, and we found out that uh, not only had he done that, but guys that we talked to in the business said, you know, I think they're going together or something like that. You know what I mean? And so, I mean, he had seduced this little girl, this young lady, and, and gave her those trinkets like that. So she wanted, I said, and I tried to, so I said, Juggy, you shouldn't do that, ma'am. You, first of all, you don't know how to record this girl. You don't know what you do. You, know, you, know, you can't do it. Oh, I got cats in New York and do that, you know. I said, well, all right, <laughs> you got it. And it was a joke. It was a joke because uh, I knew some cats in New York playing on a record. They had Bob in the studio, and cats say, Bob, Juggy got in an argument with the musicians, and they, and, and, and Bob was going to sleep. <laughs> it, was, it was a bad situation there. But I knew he didn't understand how to deal with the gym lane. So that, that was the last, you know, we got to do an album on brother, uh, Barbara, but, you know, she gone. Huh? So, Wardell, speaking of New York sessions, can you talk a little bit about how you had gone up to New York and how, you, how the whole Dixie Cup session came up at... With, with Joe Jones orchestrating that one? Oh, God. <laughs> Joe Jones. He did this record with Howard called You Talk Too Much. I think you did that, Howard. Mm-hmm. You Talk Too Much. And, man, he was a guy. 
it gets on elevators. I don't care who's on it. You can be the president of the United States. He's always passing out a card. I'm George Johnson. I did. You talk too much. You talk too much. You talk too much. You're talking. Everybody looking at each other. Who the heck is you talk too much? I said, well, that's George Jones. Well, then anyway, uh, he finally hooked up with me in New Orleans. He said, what the hell? I have, uh, I have a, a group, a young uh, group of uh, sisters. It was two, was two sisters and, and another young lady. And they call themselves the District Cups, and I want you to rehearse them because I want to record them. So first of all, the only thing I knew about Joe Jones that he uh, he did that record. You talk too much, <laughs> <laughs> and he really talked me into doing it. So uh, I started rehearsing the group like that, and he lived about a, about a block or two from me when I was on New Orleans Street. And he uh, he was one of those kind of cast man. You talk too much, and now he really talked too much because he can get some he gets himself into a whole lot of good things, man. But he talks himself out of it. He didn't know when to stop talking. So he should have made a record. I better stop talking. <laughs> I talk too much. I better stop. So he, uh, uh, so I, I rehearsed the group and things like that. So he said, man, you know what, uh, I think I'm going to go to New York and, and record them. And at that time, man, we, we went up to New York uh, with... Uh, Guy, a, a good artist called Shine Washington, uh, Shine Robinson, Al Shine Robinson, and uh, Earl King. We couldn't have that. Earl King, Al Robinson, me. Um, who, who the heck else was that? Uh, the piano player with the, with the big fingers, man. Uh, Escarita. Oh, Escarita. We went with Escarita too. And Escarita and Earl King almost got into a big fight over that. Well, I ain't going to say what the song was that they was fighting about. Because like how I don't want to repeat nothing in front of the ladies. Because uh, if you clear your ears, I mean, if you close your ears, I'll tell the men what you say. But uh, uh, anyway, so I'm rehearsing, I'm rehearsing, I'm rehearsing. We finally got, and the, Dix, the Dixie Cups is a, was a group of two sisters and, and another young lady. And they really had good ears, uh, you know. So the only thing I did with them is to uh, perfect some of the songs that we went up to New York to sing. But they had natural ability as far as hearing their harmony and things like that. All I had to do was just perfect it in a in sense, you know what I mean? So we finally go to New York. Was it New York? Or it was New York. We go there, man, and had studio time uh, for another group at, at one of the studios. And what, what Joe did, he went up to that place and he told the studio, okay, I'm here uh, with a session for... Uh, the Lieben Stoller. Somewhere we we start packing, we start unpacking, start playing our music and things like that. And Lieben Stoller come walking in there. He said, "Man, I thought we had the studio time." And the guy said, "Well, this is your musicians and all." He said, "Well, who is that?" He said, "A guy named you talk too much, Joe Jones." <laughs> so Joe Jones, uh, they finally went and said, "Hey, man, what's going on? This is my studio time." And Joe Jones talked his way into letting these people hear the Dixie Cups. And from the Dixie Cups, uh, they had this young lady that they wrote. Uh, 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 she wrote the. Um, uh, oh man! No, no, someone from the Orleans. I think uh, Joe Jones and the Dixie chapel. Cups. They gone to the chapel. Uh, she wrote the song and uh, left the Dixie Cups. We rehearsed that and we recorded it. Now Joe Jones said, "Now look, Waddell, I can't pay you anything. Now this is way back in the game. Now when I saw practice, and he said, but." If I do anything, I will hire you to go, to come with me. Okay, I said, fine, man. So I was doing all this for nothing. Uh, I, nobody in New Orleans knows what money is as far as recording because you love the work and the music so much, the, the money came later, you know, it's in my mind anyway. So, man, we rehearsed and then finally the song come out and it hits. So the song comes out in here, and I say, okay, Joe, uh, Joe, uh, when are we going out? Is he going out where, man? Uh, uh, I say, when, you gonna, when I'm going to go out so I can start preparing? He said, well, I got somebody else to do the work. I say, why? He said, because I, I thought, man, you know, you were home, man, and I didn't think that you would like to go to New, to New York to work and all that. I say, well, man, why didn't you ask me? So that was another one of my experiences with musicians that, Man, if you don't put it on paper, forget it. 
So that was my experience with that. And everything I came out with musicians, man, it's always the troublemakers uh, for some way, you know. But well, I have a whole lot of stories to tell, man, about they should have called me the middleman and a whole lot of things because I remember I was working for the union as the secretary of the union. So they sent me to, to, uh, to oversee a session as someone was doing so I go to the studio and I'm overseeing, man, and hear the, one of the artists and one of the background singers is arguing why he had a hit. So I'm just listening. I say, man, when is this going to start and all things like that? Man, I do, the, 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 the background singer said, if it wasn't for me, it wouldn't have been a hit. And the, then the recording artist said, man, if it wasn't for me, we wouldn't have cut the song. And they start fighting so the, so the, uh, the, the artist pick up a, a, a two-by-four. It was ready to hit him in the head, and I was in the middle of it. And I put my hand up in the air, and it hit my arm, but it, it was a glance, you don't know, understand. So I said, man, and another thing, another thing happened to Sam. We're the same thing, man, two by four. I, when I go to studios, I'll be sure there's no two by four handy. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't get in the middle of it and things like that. But artists is something else, man. Uh, you, you have to either love them or leave them. So... <laughs> Well, we have uh, the rest of our panel, and uh, this is really a, a great honor to have. Next door now, we have Bob French, who was taught by Louis Farbrand, the great drummer. And he, uh, in addition to doing countless New Orleans sessions on drums, including stuff on Fats Domino and Earl King, he uh, also uh, leads the uh, Tuxedo Jazz Band. He started with his father and led it. This is Mr. Bob French. And we're very, very proud to uh, the gentleman on the left. Many people can make claim that they started something. This is the man that probably put the backbeat in rock and roll and helped create it. Without this man producing, arranging, putting together the bands, uh, and basically signing and doing all the leading the sessions and producing, Fats Domino and countless artists wouldn't exist. This is Mr. Dave Bartholomew. Pass him. I, I worked out of Hollywood, 6425 Hollywood Boulevard, for 25, 30, 30 years for Lucia. I said to say this, always have admired Mr. Let me, talk, let me see him. Uh, what else is there? We all call him Mr. Quizzy Q. <laughs> By saying Quizzy Q, he really never got a break. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mr. Wardell is there. And the one next to him on the end, Shelly and Cher. Sonny and Cher. <laughs> they never got that just do is what I'm trying to say. Gentlemen, it's nice to see you guys. Mr. Baptiste, instrumental in being there a long time. And I was fortunate enough to make some wrecks with different labels. I was, I can sit out now. When you get to be 89 years old, that's what I am. You got to sit down sometime. <laughs> Dave, can now you... that I got everybody's attention, where's my money? <laughs> Dave, can yes, you... he knew that was coming. <laughs> Dave, can you talk a little bit about the first time you ever went into Cosmo Studio and how you recorded for Deluxe, how that came to be? Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say this too first. And Dr. Ira, a wonderful friend, has been around me for the last 40 years. 
And I want you to know that he's a great, great man, always looking out for the New Orleans musician. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Before I forget. Uh, now I will answer some questions that uh, he will ask, and if I don't like them, I won't answer. No, okay, go ahead on. All right. Can you talk a little bit about the first time you went to Cosmo's studio and before, what first uh, session you did for Deluxe? Um, the first time I went to Cosmo's studio, I would say Mr. Cosmo was tested to you. Happened to be the best friend I've ever had in my life. Got out of the army, and some people told me that there's a recording studio down on Rampart Street. So I went down there. And I saw Mr. Matassa, and he said, Dave, uh, that's and so, so and so, I put my band together. In 1947, I got out, out of the Army, and I started my band. I was in 196 AGF band, that's the Army band, for four years, all over Europe, different places, and happened to be with some great, great musicians, great people. And I learned an awful lot from these different people, great musicians, and a lot of guys were in the army that were very instrumental in being education. I said that to say this. So one Saturday I had a date to go to the USO and see this girl, this special girl I'd been talking to. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, at last I got up to say, yeah, well, I want to talk to you, you know. So what actually happened, a guy by the name of Mr. Abraham Malone was our piano player in the 196 AGF band. That's the army band. And he told me, say, here is a chart. This is for you to learn how to write. You can play. He said, but you don't know how to write. I said, you're right. Took that chart. I said, look, man, just let me slide. This is Saturday. I want to go to town and have some fun. He said, hey, you get this, you can have a lot of fun. Once you learn how to write and do something. So sure enough, I started putting down different things in the army band. Quite natural. You could try them out because it was far that was in that band the military band, and we broke down the orchestra out of that. So sure enough, that's the way it started. Different little things, and I worried him to death. He said, no, you, you, you got the seven cotton on the bottom, and they are supposed to be there. What is the time to get the tone? What you want to sell is the melody first. Get somebody to sing what you're doing, then you got them going. He said, whatever you do to make it so simple, make it real simple so they can understand just what, you know, where you're coming from. So sure enough, I started doing that. With, with the band in 1947, Bob, I wrote some little ditties. I didn't know they were, you know, anything on the value, but the people started coming out. Working at the Greystone. I walked in the Greystone, the man, I said, I want, I want you to play with all of you. I said, guess what I say? You're going to give me $12 a night because the scale was about 5 or $6 a night. He said, I'm not going to give you no $12 a night. He said, I'm going to give you fellas $18 a night, 18 I said, eight, well, eight, what? You said 18, I said, well, how you say that? $18 per man. Mr. Clarence Hall, I had played with a lot of older bands, Papa Salastan, Joe Robichaux, name it, I played with all the guys when I was 15 years old. I was playing first trumpet with Moat. In, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I was playing with the band, was also Claiborne Williams and Donaldson, Louisiana. So I played with all the old musicians when I was 15 years old. I could read. And during, during those times, you had to be a first trumpet player to play in all those bands. So that meant I was kind of busy on weekends, catch the bus out of New Orleans and go to Donaldsonville, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and different, Gonzales, places like that, and play with these different bands. Claiborne Williams and another band that would, uh, uh, out of uh, Houston, I, can't, I mean out of Baton Rouge, I can't think of the name at the present time. But that's how I got started. And these people saw that around me. So I learned to start getting off. But then getting back to the Army, the first thing I put out, at the Greystone. Went in the Greystone. Oh, well, what is this? Packed and jammed. You're doing something, Bellamy. Sure enough, that was a stepping stone. Everybody all over New Orleans, Louisiana, coming in to hear me play. Next thing I know, the late Don Roby, Houston, Texas, had me come to this place. That's when everything started looking up big money. So he said, um, I'd like to have you for about three or four weeks. I said, oh, yes, indeed. No more grits and grease for breakfast and shredded milk, no that ham. Oil. <laughs> sure enough, that's where musicians talk to each other. We never look back. All the little ditches and things are like, like that. So what actually happened, happened. So we're working into playing different places, doing all right. 
So I go to Cosmo, he said, anything that you want to do, just have your auditions here. Here's the big thing. Get back from Houston, Texas. Here's a guy by the name of Antoine Fats Domino. Breaking up the place in the ninth ward. So, what is this? I walked in there, couldn't get in the door. And he and I got together. We had 19 million sellers in a row with the help of Mr. Cosmo Matassa and great, great musicians from the Papa Salastan band, different other bands that was in New Orleans, Louisiana at that time. So it wasn't all me. I was here with us and so and so. And I had the greatest drummer in the world, musical genius, the late Earl Palmer. I had, everybody said Bartholomew, but I had an awful lot of help. And we never looked back. Mr. Tansel, I said, look, we're going there like 10 o'clock in the morning, 10, 10 o'clock at night, we're still there. And Mr. Cosmos never said, when well, I'm tired, that's and so and so. So I had an awful lot of people to thank, ladies and gents, Mr. Cosmo Matassa, a great, great man, and all these musicians up here. They didn't get the just do like I got it. Mr. Baptiste on the end, he got some, but Mr. Wardell is there, and all he got was Pat on the back. Mr. Wardell is there, I want to thank you. Cause his last two, last two I made in Europe about 15, 20 years ago. Mr. Wardell is there, started with me in Paris on piano. Every day on his intermission, guess what he got at night? Some more music for us to play. <laughs> So went all over Paris, went to Riviera, stayed at the Riviera. I think that's the last time he played in my bed. In other words, it was, he was, every time I turned around, he had a rehearsal going on. Not to change the thing from Cosmo Matanza, I just want to show I had everybody helping me. Some people say I didn't do it by myself, so I had an awful lot of great help from everybody associated with all my success. What I, want to, I don't want to just leave anybody out. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. I might add that some people ask me, why didn't you get your own publishing company? That's another one. To be frank with you, when we first started, I was so interested in, in trying to get a hit out there, I forgot all about the publishing because at the door we were making money. Not a lot of big money, but strong money. But when I finally got information about the publishing, the rappers woke me up. <laughs> Rap music. I said, that will never sell. And I've been so damn wrong. And these guys were smarter than Fats and I at that time. So I said to Fats, let's try to get our own publishing. I said, we will go to the big boss and tell him we're not doing anything anymore. We want part of the publishing. We have a great catalog out there, but we don't own any of the publishing. So I get what's left. And that is the truth. I take a Bible on that. Thank you. Well, see, let me tell you something about Dave, man. Uh, all, that, all, that, all, all, that, all what he's saying is true, but you have to remember this, man. He is the pioneer of rock and roll. He is the pioneer of uh, everyone in New Orleans to, to make us realize that we can do something on our own or at least get out there and try on our own. He led the way to it. And in regard to that, I appreciate you uh, saying what you had to say about me like that, Dave, but it was for you that I owe uh, my, uh, my career in the recording business. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kazan. Uh, it seems that I, I came along a little later, then, but I, I say the same thing, Dave. I used to sit on my porch. When you used to record, I mean, you used to rehearse at the Dutra, and I lived right across the street in the project. And I used to live, stand on my said, man, I think I'm playing. And I could hear it loud jumping over there. And you had the... Da -da 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 -da. My theme song. But, uh, 
there, there, there. <laughs> and I said, man, that's Dave Bartholomew. And I think I told these people, right. I had two heroes, Dave Bartholomew and Cosmo Mutazzo. And I like both of them because they didn't smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Never did. <laughs> Never did. Never did. And uh, I'd also like to say this to Mr. Allen Toussaint. Most of you here know about that storm, Katrina. And uh, we left here in a hurry. Didn't know where we were going, things like that. But we were, I was gone, my wife and I and my family, to Texas. We were living in Dallas, Texas for the last four years. And completely out of music I was because I was worrying about different things. I lost three of my musicians since that. I'm talking about that wise, you know. And the main thing about uh, being away and get a chance to see what was actually happening to the New Orleans music. Come back here now, and uh, everything is kind of new to me uh, because uh, you're having an uh, influx of a lot of new people from all over different places coming here to see what's happening with the rebuilding, I would say, of New Orleans. And uh, some are actually staying. And the identity that we had many, many years ago, we got about 15 different little bands. And I don't mean to say different little bands, but different bands, I would say, in New Orleans at the present time. And it's not, we have to keep in mind that the big beat started the second line band. That's the way I feel. That's where I got it from. But right now, some of the things I see in New Orleans is actually trying to change us. i never forget Mr. Louis Duman, who used to have the, the uh, I forget the name of the Eureka Band. And they started with the Big Beat Second Line Band, but the music was organized, put together, I believe, in organization. Harmony for two, two three horns, not just about to take them what they want to do. But uh, I find right now that it's actually changing. And I think that uh, what we need is some of the authentic music that we did many, many, many years ago. I'm talking about what we call Dixieland, traditional music. We've lost some of that. So number one, I don't hear them over the, Mr. Baptiste Klein, uh, Mr. Wardell. I don't see that anymore. You know, like, you know, uh, uh, let's say high society. You know what I'm talking about. I don't, you know, I don't hear nobody playing that. They're going around that. Uh, the beginning of Stardust, you know. You know what I mean? That type of thing. I don't hear that. All I hear is somebody, well, I got my, everybody in New Orleans is the band leader now. I got that. I don't, I'm not jealous now. I just don't like it, <laughs> you know. but uh, I, 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 but it's changed. You know, you don't see that anymore. <laughs> but like, like me, most people say, well, uh, when I play Stardust, I always play you know, the introduction. You know, but one secret I found out because it's D flat. Mostly B flat trumpet players can't play on them kind of things. You know? <laughs> but nevertheless, for that, I want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Wardell because hey, if I forget. Uh, Mr. Bob French. Bob is also on a lot of, Bob, uh, I would say, uh, fast domino tunes with me, too. But he used to hold my hand. Oh, look, you got a session going on. I don't have no money. Who oh, up? You understand? Bob French, yeah. I have to beg you. <laughs> Why don't you tell the story, Bob? <laughs> I'll tell it. Well, that's true. <laughs> well, <laughs> well every, everybody sitting up here can tell you. The drummer, the great uh, Palmer, was nobody coming behind him. So I uh, said, well, I might take off one of those type of things. And I, I said, okay, Bobby, and he went on vacation. <laughs> thank you. I like to tell a story about Dave. Uh, years ago, when, when I first got into, uh, into recording business, they didn't have the uh, that expressway that they have now on Claiborne Avenue. I guess that's the expressway, whatever it is. Yeah, right now, I mean, well, that's what it is now, I guess. But they haven't started building that, you know. So we always had a place across uh, from where he had his office to go get some oyster loaf and raw oysters and things like that. So one day I came at the studio, I mean, at the office. I'm sitting on the dev camp later. Uh, and I was eating some dietitian cookies. I was about 260 pounds at that time. And Dave kind of said, man, what is that you eat? And I said, man, that's some diet, uh, dietitian. Uh, I've just got to lose some weight, man. He said, oh, okay. 
So he go in the back, you get a, a magazine, you say, hey, what the, look at this, man. And there is a magazine with duck, there's roast, there's some pig meat and all that kind of, all steaming up in there. And I said, Dad, man, don't do that to me, man. So, <laughs> so he said, oh, don't do what, man? I said, well, don't be showing me that, man. I said, okay. So he said, oh, what the hell, I'll be back. So he went across the street to the oyster place and got an oyster loaf. And he came back, and I'm, I'm trying to write some music or concentrate on something. And Dave said, hey, man, look at this, man. And there's that oyster loaf, fresh as can be, smelling as can be, and there goes my cookies. <laughs> I'll never forget that, man. Dave, Dave was a cruel dude. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I got one more to tell you about what else. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> no, we're not. I'm a, well, this one, but you got to hear this one. So he hadn't played piano in a long time. The lady that with Frank, I got no. I said I got a European too. He said I need some money. I said, well, you the next piano player. He said, no, I'm not. So sure enough, I said, oh, come on, what else? So we're going to Paris. We stay in Paris two weeks. We come back to New Orleans. Go back to Rivera. When we're back in the river area, we're up in the mountains. I mean, way up in the mountains. We don't have no rest. We just real tired. So when we get up there, the young guy interested in the piano play, watch it, whatever. <laughs> he said, hey, mister, come over here. This man's sleeping on the piano. <laughs> <laughs> whatever was sleeping on the piano. <laughs> He said, y'all supposed to be playing. I said, well, that's okay. Just let him make this money. <laughs> Good night. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> that was the second time in my life I seen you as a cruel man. Because <laughs> one of the first songs we pulled out was uh, uh, Stardust. And I remember to tell you something, I'm not a piano player. I'm, I'm not what you call a tinkler. I can sit down there and I can play the chords, but I can't doodle. So if you say doodle, I walk away from you. So he is, man, he said, what else? Give me an introduction. I said, blink, 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 blink. So he comes in with the thing, man, and heaven only knows I couldn't play the cards at all. That's the first time I played uh, <laughs> Stardust in such a cruel key. <laughs> Make these piano players that's coming out now with that weird music sound crazy. <laughs> but I never forgave you that for him either. <laughs> Way in France at that. What did we use that kind of new chemistry? Uh, we had good times with you, Dave. Thank you. Bob, you want to talk a little bit about how you got your chemistry, Dave? I got my shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And I threatened him. <laughs> no, no, actually, I, I like to say this. This this is a pleasure to be here. I, I had forgotten, and I got a phone call this morning. I said, who is this, Sam? And it was Ira. I said, are you coming? Coming where, Ira? I thought it was at night. I thought... <laughs> <laughs> then, I, then I called Dave. He said, well, it's this morning? I said, yeah, I'll be down and get you. I dressed. I called my son. Got our personal chauffeur. Called my son. He picked me up. We went and got Dave, and, and we're here. Hmm. But I, I have to say this. You have to give due where, where it's due. This man sitting on the end, the one sitting right here, and the one sitting here. This is New Orleans. They're New Orleans. As far as when you talk about music, you got to talk about one of the three, all three of them, okay? Because he has done so many things, written so many good songs. I'm talking about Mr. Baptiste. I'm going to call y'all Mr. Baptiste because all y'all older than me. <laughs> I, I, I have a band. Everybody in my band is young. They, they call me old. Old folks, you know, they call me old folks. I say, just keep living. Maybe you get to be old one day. Yeah. But anyway, I respect my elders because I came up in a family with a daddy. I had a daddy and a mother. And uh, coincidentally, my mother and this man is related, so that automatically that makes us. The biggest sitter in Louisiana. Right. Yeah. Ed Gard, Louisiana. Ed Gard, Louisiana. <laughs> but if, you, if you're riding through, if you, if you blink your eyes, you missed it. Yeah. Sitting on, sitting right by the levee. But anyway, I, I was always around music 
from the time I was born. My daddy was a banjo player, guitar player, and I, I've always heard, heard music. I was hearing music when I was in my mother's stomach. And when I got to be about 14 years old, I got interested in playing music. My daddy, being a musician, he knew better than me. I wanted to play drums. He said, no, nah, you don't want to play drums. He said, you'll be the first one on a gig and the last one to leave with all that stuff. <laughs> so he said, I got a better idea. Let's go to World Lines and get you a trumpet. Now, this is in the 50s, Wardell. Now, he, he, he was a trumpet player, too. So did Dave. He bought me a king trumpet player in the 50s, like 1951, like my freshman year at St. Augustine. And my daddy paid like 300 and a couple of dollars for, for this horn. $300 in the 50s was a lot of money. And I was telling him, you don't have to spend all this money. He said, well, if you're going to play, play on something good. It makes it easy for you. I said, but I don't want to play. I want to play drums. <laughs> but back in them days, you have to listen to that mom and daddy, okay? So I got the trumpet, start taking trumpet lessons from Houston, Houston Music School. Houston itself, okay? And I was all right, and I played a little bit, and I played around. And uh, the more I played it, the more I hated it, okay? You got to like it to do it. So I finally talked my daddy into getting a set of drums for me. And we went to Rampart Street. Rampart Street is that away. And uh, the 100 block of Rampart Street, there were pawn shops. And it, the, the one, of, one of the world's greatest drummers besides... Earl Palmer, Louis Barbaran. You heard of Paul Barbaran who wrote the Bourbon Street Parade and all those other things. His brother. As far as playing traditional music, nobody could touch him. Nobody. And if they tell you somebody is better than them, tell them Bob Frank said they're alive. Because <laughs> this man could play. And I, I sat under him on many nights because at 15 years old, my daddy was... was had had the band. He, he played with Celestan band, just like he did. And when Celestan died, the trombone player took over the band. Uh, what was his name? Oh, uh, t -t 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 I talked about the band all day yesterday. I'll tell you his name. Eddie, Eddie Pearson. Eddie Pearson lived two years. He died. My dad took over the band. And they had this old school bus. And this school bus is in La Place, on a property in La Place. And it's sitting down with grass growing around it. I'm going around and knock the grass from around and take some pictures of it because it was part of the history of the band. And um, I would drive the bus. They'd go 100, 200 miles. Everybody in the band go to sleep. I'm driving, 15 years old. I got a license. I'm legal. But I'm around these people, and I'm, I'm absorbing some of that knowledge. If you want to learn something, listen to somebody that's older than you that has some knowledge. Don't listen to a fool. There are a lot of fools out there. But you listen, listen to somebody that knows what they're doing. And I was around these people, and they, they, they really taught me some things. Mr. Barbrand, make a long story short, Mr. Barbrand went with me. We went to drums, to, to, not to a pawn shop. And I bought a whole set of drums for $110. And I kept that set of drums for years. He would not teach me. He refused to teach me. I said, I want you to teach me. Didn't teach me. And um, to this day, I'm sorry because he could have taught me something about traditional music that nobody else could have taught me. But I learned how to play a little bit, and I can still play a little bit. But that was the beginning of my venture into music. So I started playing, practicing. The first band I started with, Art Neville was in the band. Charles Neville was in the band. A young man by the name of James Booker was in the band. It was J.C. Goods. Y'all don't know anything about it. His daddy had more money than any black man in this city. He had a moving company. And we used to go to his house and rehearse every day. He had three pianos in the living room. And uh, his mother-in-law lived there. And she would feed us, seven of us, every day. And uh, that, was, that was a pleasure. We'd leave school, go rehearse. Got the band together. It was a turquoise. Stayed together a while. First one to leave was uh, Charles Neville. He left, went with a band in, in Florida. All up older than him, you know. That's where he learned all his bad habits from, okay? And then Art Neville left and went with the Hawkettes. And the year he left, they recorded 
uh, the Mardi Gras Mambo, which is still played every Mardi Gras. Okay, and then JC, he stayed and, and he played with some people. And my first band that I played with, that besides that band that was worth anything, was James Sugarboy Crawford, uh, who Dave knew. He didn't record for you, did he, Dave? He recorded for you. Okay. Well, he had a big hit. He had a couple of big hits. And I started playing and making money, and I was making $8 a night. That was big money. Eight bucks. You know, you could buy a gallon of gas for 25 cents back in the days. And so that was my first experience. So after I got so I could play a little bit, I, I see what saw what out Mr. Kazare when I was in high school. Because the band that he played with, the Royal Dukes of Rhythm, they used to play for all our functions at St. Augustine. Okay? And Mr. Baptiste, he was always at the Dew Drop or somewhere playing and, and uh, playing with the bebop bands. He played everything. He played bebop, R&B, blues, you know. And this, this is what you had to do in New Orleans. You had to learn how to play everything. He did the same thing. Dave did the same thing. But uh, I, I played this music, and I was lucky to, to, to play with with, with, uh, with Sugar Boy, and I played with Frogman Henry. I, I sang like a frog. Yeah, made a lot of money right down the street on Bourbon Street. And so when I got into the music, he lived like three doors from me on Robert Street. So I'd go down in his house, his family, so we can talk. I said, man, when are you going to give me a session? You know, I jacked him up in his house and said, you got, you got to, you got to give me a session. He said, "Well, I'm not Earl Palmer, you know. So you, you got to, you got to wait your turn." I said, "Maybe, but you, you, you can give me a session, you know, because I, I, I want to do this." No way in the world I was in the category with Earl Palmer. Earl, Earl Palmer was one of the greatest drummers that ever picked up two drumsticks. So I kept on, kept on, kept on, and um, one day uh, before that. He hired me to do one or two sessions with uh, Earl King and somebody else. Well, that was it, you know. And um, I was home one afternoon. I was still at home. I was living with mom and daddy. Easy to live there. They feed you and put, and, put, and put a roof over your head. So the phone rang. It was a Saturday. I'll never forget this. And it was Dave. He said, what you doing? I said, nothing. I was just laying, looking at TV, looking at some sports on TV. He said, Bring your stuff down to the studio. At that time, you had to bring your own equipment. Bring your stuff to the studio. Antoine Drummer didn't show up. Tanu was the drummer. Cornelius, what is his name? Cornelius what? You remember his last name? Huh? Cornelius Coleman. But but it was Tanu. He said, Tanu didn't show up. Come on down. I had on a pair of Bermuda shorts in them days. I would, out of the Bermuda shorts, would put some real clothes on and down at Cosmo Studio on Rampart Street in 20 minutes. You're going to recall with Fast Domino. I was running over the red lights and everything else. <laughs> Fast Domino was the biggest thing in the country. So I go in. This is where Cosmo comes into play. And I, I, I love this man to this day because I was met, many times that I, I recorded, he was always the same. He had that smile on his face, always talked to you like you were a man. Even when I wasn't a man, he did. And we go in and we record. So we did the, they, the band was rehearsing. So I set up the drums. They said, well, we're going to take, do it. We're going to do it. We're going to run through it. Then we're going to take. And they did a take. <laughs> and uh, Kaz came out the studio. Wait, wait. He said, look, I know what you're doing, but you're going to have to play louder. Turn your drumsticks around. You got to bang. We got one microphone in the whole room has to pick up all the instruments. It wasn't like it is today. Huh? One one microphone. The man was a miracle man. Is a miracle man. Still alive and with us, thank God. So we do the we do the thing, we play it, and after we played it, he, he did this to me. He said, All right, it was loud enough. So we played it back. Dave is in the <laughs> Dave is in the studio with uh, in, in inside the uh the booth. Trying to get a balance. With, 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 with cars, okay? So we did we did the first one, and after, after we did it, <laughs> we played it back, and so he said, Antoine, turn the fast. What do you think about it? Yeah. Take another one. So said, okay. We took another one. Oh, no, take another one. 
We're up to 15 now. <laughs> Take another. Sometimes, excuse me, Bob, but sometimes in the studio at that time we have to move the drums. It's a small room, different places, and it worked the hell out of him. Not only him, any drummer that came there, because we didn't have all the things that you have. Now you just push the button if you want more drums. What is, those days were rough. Going to the studio at 8 in the morning, 8 at night, you're still there. My first one, I say, ain't nobody in the world be in no studio all day long. So she and the bass player wife, came Frank Fields. This is really true. They got there one day about 12 o'clock, and we had been there since 8 o'clock. 10 o'clock that night, they hell with you guys. You know, I said, yeah, nobody does anything like this. But right now, you just push busting it all over with. But we had to do this to try to get a balance. Sometimes they talk, and I said, well, please don't talk, uh, because we, not, we don't have but one or two mics, and that's what's happening. We're trying to get a balance. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. That's what my drummer said. I mean, my uh, guitar player, God bless the dead. I said, Justin. Justin, I said, Justin, please. And he was my regular guitar player. Said, he kept on. I said, look, man, we've been here four or five hours. Take the rest of the year off. And he said, oh, that man. That, this is true. I wasn't, and you know, I didn't mean that in the sense that it was said, but he was messing with progress. <laughs> when he stayed there for the last 10, I mean, he was back for the last 25 years. But man, thing it when in the studio, it's, it's a business like anything else. And right now, you don't have no problem. Just push a button. It's all over with. Back to power. So after we got it all straight, played another one, played it for Antoine. Ant Dave loved it. And uh, now nah, let's take another one, Brother Alamin. So after we got up to take 22, I remember this like it was yesterday. After we got to take 22, I don't care because we're making money. Uh, see, the longer we stay, the more money we make. So we got to 22. He played it for him. It wasn't, wasn't anything wrong with it. So he said, but I don't know. Play, play the take, take two. Went back and played it. You remember? Play, take, take two. Played it. The old one played it. And after he played it, he said, that's it. That's the one I want. <laughs> I don't remember the song, but I know one thing. I played it in my sleep for a couple of nights. <laughs> but but the, the beauty of, of working with Cosmo and working with him, he knew what he was doing. Cosmo knew what he was doing. They never had an argument. They never had a disagreement. Okay? Those two. Now, he and Antoine, that's another thing. <laughs> I, <laughs> you want me to leave it on? No, I'm going to expose y'all. <laughs> I, I can tell him a little bit, huh? D Dave knows what he's doing, right? Antoine, heck of a musician, heck of a singer, but he likes to have his way. So Clarence Ford, heck of a saxophone player, he's dead. I knew Clarence. They got into an argument in the studio. And I was like, I was getting out the way. I was going to fisticuffs, you know. So Clarence tapped me on the knee and said, don't worry about it, Bob. They love each other. They ain't going to fight. So they got into a thing and got into a thing. And so they said, okay, we're going to do it your way. So they did it. It wasn't right. So they wound up doing it their way. And it was all right. But I wound up staying in the studio one day for 12 hours. The greatest thing about staying in there for 12 hours is after you pass three hours, you started getting overtime. So by me being 18, 19 years old, I could have stayed in there for 24 hours. It wouldn't have made any difference. You know, I, yeah, give me something to eat. They sent out to get something to eat. We eat, get a little taste, go on back again. And my first check from, from Fast Domino, that was, that was about the third or fourth. The first check was... What was it, 35, 30, what was the recording session? About 30, 35 dollars, right? Yeah. Right. So, went, huh? 4125. All right, I'm, I'm close enough. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how he's 89 years old, he can remember those things. Uh, that was, <laughs> that was that a lot was, of money. That was the union. Uh, that, that was union scale. In all my sessions, 496, that was our union at that time. We're at 174 right now, but we are now integrated. So at that time, the union man always had to sit. Mr. Baptiste, you remember that? 
the union man would sit there doing the whole session. All he's doing is get the time, Mr. John. Uh, if you, I don't know if you remember Mr. John, man made by three like me. He would sit there, and all he's doing is timing. That means that whatever it is, and when the session is over, they'll get the, get the fellas on the side and say, well, okay, you got five or six hours overtime, whatever, that kind of thing. Which was nice, because we used to work the people to death in a place like that to get a sound. But right now, but what, but what I've been saying is true. By paying the drums, I like to kill them. Because sometimes we have to move the drums from one corners of the other and that type of said, oh Lord, what is this man you know but it all paid off I didn't mind Dave <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mind I was working I was playing with Fast Domino and David Thalman but when I went down to get the you had to wait a week to get your check and I went to the union that was on Claiborne Street and the woman gave me the check and when I got the check my hands started shaking it was over five hundred dollars. It went from thirty some odd dollars to that overtime to five hundred dollars. I said, I know I'm in the right business. <laughs> so I started begging him again. When are you gonna give me some of the other session? Couldn't play none because Earl was there, right? So anyway, Earl got to be worldwide known and went to California. I was saluting him goodbye. So I said, well, now Earl is, Earl is gone to California. Uh, what about the job now? Do I get the job now? He said, yeah, you got the job. Because I used to always tell him, you remember that what I used to always say? I said, you know, Dave, it's a shame. You have a recording session. It's always the same people. Click. You got the click. You're in the click. Always with the click. Hey, don't, give, don't give the youngsters a chance. The only thing I was doing was a couple of things, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's always the clicks. I had a band, and he recorded my whole band with one of the guys singing. I said, I'm tired of that click thing. So when Earl left and went to uh, went to California, he called me and said, I got some gigs for you. So we played the first the first time <laughs> session, and uh, after after we got through the session, he said, How you like the click now? <laughs> that is really the truth. I, that's the truth. I ain't I ain't lying. I said, I love the click because I'm in the click now. <laughs> well, we wanted to uh, thank our participants, Harold Batiste, <laughs> Cordell Cazair, Bob French. He started it off, Dave Bartholomew. And Dave also wanted me to let you know that another person who's not here today that played a large role was Alan Toussaint. Because without these people, New Orleans music as we know it, and uh, probably the influence of uh, American rock and roll on the world over the last 60 to 70 years wouldn't have existed without these gentlemen. Oh, yes. Harold's got his new book out that just came out. It's a very good read. Uh, ladies and gents, I, um, I was just telling Dr. Arrow we forgot the young man is instrumental in being one of the guys that actually built New Orleans to Mr. Alan Toussaint. Great piano player. Beautiful. Just a beautiful guy. Nobody in the world got more manners than him. Just He's always such a gentleman. I just didn't want to leave him out quite that Quite there are two or three others, but you know I'm not too close to them, so I wouldn't be able to say anything. But all these people up here and Mr. Allen Toussaint, some people that actually built New Orleans.